Hello, hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here in Town Hall. I have, since I've stepped into government a year and a half ago, I've, I have a strange fascination now for government. When, to be honest, before I had this strange invitation from the mayor, my, the only relationship that I had to government was voting once every six years, and now here I am. So basically, I'm here to, first of all, tell you about a little, very little lab for a very big city, and why possibly government is one of the most fascinating jobs out there, believe it or not. So as I mentioned, the laboratory for the city has been around for a year and a half. We are not alone in the world. We are part of a family of laboratories that is popping up all over. This was a, a map done by Parsons, Parsons Design School. And um, as you can see, there's places such as, there's labs in France, there's labs in New York. And possibly the interesting thing about Laboratory for the City, it's the first one in the emerging world, it's the first one in, in Latin America in a megalopolis. So what makes us very different, because we are all children of our own spaces and our own cities, as well as where we're placed in, in terms of the government structure, is possibly this, Mexico City. So Mexico City, as you might know, might not know, is the biggest city in the Western Hemisphere. It's 22 million people strong. 50% of its population is under age 26, so it's also an incredibly young city. All of the numbers when you speak about Mexico City are huge. Like if you speak about our subway, five million people step onto our subway every day, which is the whole of Chicago getting up and down. We have five million people that come from the neighboring states into the city as well to work every day. We have almost 32 active volcanoes surrounding the valley. So as you can imagine, it's not necessarily a city for the faint-hearted. 50% um, of our population works in the informal economy, but it is also the eighth largest city economy in the world. So one of the things that we have found very interesting is that possibly the things that we start prototyping and the things that we think about in Mexico City might not only be relevant to this far away, slightly exotic city for the rest of the world, but actually for, for a lot of other cities um, worldwide. One of the things that has been said very often is that 50% of humanity is now living in cities and by, in, by 2050 it's gonna be 70%. What is not that often said is that Latin America actually reached that 50% in the 70s and we are now uh, up to 70% ourselves. And most of the newer cities as well as the mega cities are actually not gonna be born in Europe or in the US but in the emerging world, in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa. So we need to start figuring out what we're gonna be doing with cities this size and with these extreme characteristics, um, economically, socially, and just like these extreme urban environments if we are to know what, what humanity is gonna push forward in the next years. Uh, because this city, as you also probably know, hosts both the, the world's number one, number two billionaire, as well as we have a population that is living off one of the lowest minimum wages in the whole of Latin America. So, what is the lab doing? So it's a very little lab, very big city. Two of our main focuses are civic innovation and urban creativity. Civic innovation basically means how can we start reinventing and reimagining the way that government and civil society come together both using talent, citizen talent in much stronger ways as well as being able to open up the doors of government to people that have not necessarily found it an exciting or relevant place to work out of. In terms of urban creativity, we're thinking that the city in and of itself should be the space for ideas and for, for citizen engagement and basically that tissue that brings us all together in this great cultural artifact that is a city. This is my team. Uh, I have 19 people working for me and uh, this opening up of government to different sorts of, of perspectives and as well as profiles actually starts right here. I have everything from artificial intelligence experts to urban geographers, historians, artists, designers, filmmakers, journalists, architects, uh, policy makers, international relationships, etc. And it's also a very young team as you can see. This is, this is a, a, about six months ago, so there's some people that have been added to, to this motley crew, if you will. Um, average age is about 29, and we actually report directly to the mayor's office, so we're in a very good space to actually be able to influence public policy. And uh, I have said many times that as a laboratory for the city, we're actually the lab's number one experiment, the, the very first one. Uh, what happens when you bring in people from civil society 
and put them in the mayor's office and have and just like have very different disciplines that are usually involved in, in the decisions of city making. This is um, our space. We ended up at, on the rooftop of a government building, which I found incredibly metaphorical with a view to the whole valley of Mexico City. Mexico City is not only the largest city in the, in, on the continent, but also the oldest. It's almost 600 years old and has been the largest city in, in American continent since 1450, I believe. Uh, and we get to see that historical place of the city from where we work. This is a lab. And this is a lab. And one of the things that we decided from the very beginning is that if we were going to talk about open government and open city and civic innovation, our space should also be a metaphor of the things that we believe in and the way that we want to be in the world. So this has slowly become, in this last year and a half, a meeting space for civil society and government. We have wanted a, the, this building to become not only a place of services and complaints, as government usually is, but also of ideas and debates and. Uh, and just like some incredibly exciting people that are, that are part of this strange thing of being part of government. So we have all sorts of events, forums, talks, workshops, etc. And we have also had the pleasure of having some of the most amazing minds worldwide become part of the lab. This is Perry Chen. As you probably know, he's a co-founder of Kickstarter. He was our first resident. So what Perry did two weeks after stepping down as CEO of Kickstarter, uh, and becoming chairman of the board was come to work with us for about a month. So this is the type of government we believe in and people that are changing and defying the rules of how things are done. As you probably know, Kickstarter is the largest crowd funding platform nowadays pulling in more than $1 million a day. So what can cities learn from people like him? What can we learn from people like him? And so basically, when people come down with us, we usually host events at the rooftop, as well as put them together with policymakers as well, and people on the ground, so we can start influencing both what happens within government, but also inspiring what happens without of it. We have also had the pleasure of having people such as Eric Hersman with us, who's the co-founder of Ushaidi, uh, that has, as you probably know, changed the way that information flows from these big organizations and the grassroots movements switching things around. Uh, or Skylar Tibbetts, who was the one that coined the, the word 4D printing and has been speaking about and experimenting in self-assembly architecture. So how, how does this influence the way that we think about cities, the way that we think about uh, government as well. Um, we host both small events and large events because we think that the first technology is conversation. Like the first thing that we have to break is these separation, separations and divides between government and civil society. So many times we start off with a series of talks that are called Explorations for a Megalopolis. This one was about a walkable city or a, or a walkable megalopolis, if you will. And we ha have the pleasure of having full house every time, which is amazing. For here we had more than 600 people, and it was everything from the directors of the big foundations that are dealing in mobility, as well as a lot civil society, civil servants, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're trying to do is how do we start having conversations that are about the city in and of itself. It's not about government policy, it's not about only what is happening on, in, on a grassroots level, but actually being able to create these hybrid spaces where all of this is joined by the hip. Um, besides these larger events that are hosted all over the city, we're, we're also very interested in starting to experiment in public spaces with new formats and new ways of engaging the political imagination, if you will. This is a, a artwork created by the artist Pedro Reyes, and we hosted a series of talks on this uh, during an urban festival in Mexico City. It's called Agora, Mobile Agora. And we passed a slightly controversial mobility law in Mexico City. So here, we're, here we were having discussions where on the left side, you see people that were for these changes in, in public policy, and on the right side, people who were against. So we actually believe that we can start playing with political language and urban forms to be able to not only have government be this, this um, useful and practical thing, but how can we also have fascination, if you will, and imagination become part of our, our political landscape once again. Um, the lab works with what we call experiments. This is, this is actually our website. Um, we've hosted more than 40 experiments by now in this last year and a half. Some of them are small in size. Some of them will take the next four years that we have in office. And we also work through what we're calling provocations, which are open-ended questions. So we, we have the feeling that um, we need these spaces where government can 
can play and experiment and sometimes even fail because on one end we always expect our governments to be very solid and sure-footed and go and, and go forward knowing what they're doing for obvious reasons but on the other hand many times we complain that government is not necessarily privy to some of the most exciting ideas that are out there um, so what the what labs do worldwide is more or less function as a space that mitigates this risk this is a place where governments can take language, political language, or just like social uh, experiments and innovation a little bit further, and nothing happens if, if it doesn't work out because there will be lessons. And once we know that this is something interesting, then we can actually start working with the work, rest of the government and the other ministries to implement these, these ideas. Um, so many of these experiments are part of different provocations that we're thinking about. And this also has to do with being able to bring in different types of topics ideas and people into government as well. Um, we've been trying to rearticulate the, in the institution in and of itself. So for example, now we have um, a project going on that's called Open Office for Urban Play, for example, where we have Edwina Porto Carrero, who was doing her master's and doctorate at MIT. She'll, she will be working with us for the next seven months, embedded within government, thinking about what creativity public space and children have in common and how we can start thinking about network spaces. So this is a way of basically being able to open up government uh, to other people and not necessarily think that they're, they want to, as us, work for the next four years in government, but that they can actually have a say and influence public policy in the, the way that the largest city in the Western Hemisphere actually thinks about itself. Um, Part of what we do is very strategic, strategic, very serious. We've been working with the open government agenda and open city, which has to do with basically pushing beyond accountability and transparency and into collaboration, uh, participation, innovation, and the new uses of technology. Obviously, one of the, the things at the very heart is uh, the whole open data movement that we've been very actively involved in. And we formed the first working group within government. There was no language for this. There was no desire for this. And nowadays, we have everybody from the mayor to all of his most important ministers talking about open city and what this actually means for, for Mexico City. On the other hand, we are now also um, very exciting stuff, believe it or not, working with local Congress in passing the first open city law in Latin America. And what makes it also very interesting when you put different type of people to think about lawmaking is that we've come up with a dynamic law which basically will answer the question, how do you start creating legal frameworks for changing scenarios? So it's not only interesting in and of itself, but also the way that, that a, a law can become almost algorithmic and dynamic is also incredibly interesting. And this happens at the union of people that have been doing law for a long, long time within Mexico City, plus a younger crowd of people that are coming in with uh, new ideas, new paradigms, and um, do not necessarily believe all of the older rules of engagement. Uh, besides being a, uh, having these deep strategies and having, fortunately, the mayors here, we're, we have been lucky enough to be able to be slightly outlandish and playful as well. So talking about this reinvention of, of the way that government speaks to society and the way that the city itself can become part of the conversation, we've also started experimenting with what we're calling urban artifacts. So this is... Um, this is one of our urban artifacts created by two amazing Mexican artists, uh, Gilberto Esparza and Mar Marcela Armas. And what this thing does is move around the city and besides becoming a stranger chapter for all sorts of, of, of people, it also is a space where we can start inserting ourselves in the tissue of society and having people be able to leave their reflections, their complaints, their, um, their imaginaries, et cetera, et cetera, and then also give it back to the community at one point in time. So it, this will also be intervened by different artists in, in the span of the next four years, and we will be able to place it in different places of the city. So why do we also think that becoming playful and trying different things out is important? Because we, we have the feeling that cities are not necessarily only its physical space. Yes, they are the objective topographies, but it's also the social imaginaries. And this, I think, when you join them up, becomes the symbolic infrastructure of the city that we're very interested in understanding a lot better and seeing how we can create things that also travel throughout the city and throughout society and use culture and, and political and imagination and, um, and just like urban possibility in very different ways. 
Um, on the other hand, one of the things that we've been doing since the very beginning is trying to put out social thermometers. As you can imagine, having 22 million people in a city makes the, the, the term uh, civic innovation really become quite a, quite a conundrum. So one of the things that we have done with these with these digital platforms is start trying, it's starting to try f to figure out how we can bring more people into the conversation besides the experts and the very amazing people that we've been working with. So this is one digital thermometer that we put out quite often to just like have a general feel of what the city is thinking and what this is, the city is feeling. And it's also nowadays being linked up into other social media platforms so we can s see more or less where that temperature and uh, social imaginary lies, if you will. We also have um, a huge interest in open innovation and being able to tap into citizen talent. So we've also put out a few beta testings of these platforms that are a lot deeper in, in, um, in scope and have government be able to incubate citizens' ideas and, and things that are out there. So this is, this is one idea. Th then we also are trying to engage other type of, of people, such as kids, in, in this business of city making. This is also in, very much in its beta sp stages, but will be informing other things that we do further along, uh, because actually one of the, the topics that we open up this year in a very important manner is um, kids and cities. What, what do kids mean in a, to a megalopolis? How do you actually start engaging them in the business of city making? So this was a project that we created with Aldea Digital, which is the biggest um, digital inclusive event in the world. And we worked with uh, block by block, I, block by block, with Minecraft with the Minecraft people. And uh, that is, if you see, right, that is actually your office. That little jutting tower is the space that I showed you. So this is a plaza right in front of our office. And um, Minecraft has been working with kids around the world. The biggest workshop that they had hosted was about 300 kids strong. In Mexico City, we had over 7,000 kids participating in becoming digital uh, urbanists, if you will, and cre recreating the space around them. So this is actually also going to inform the, wor the way that we're going to be working with public schools, among many other things that we've been working with. Uh, as I mentioned, data has also been one of the things that we've been incredibly interested in because there's a lot, the huge community that is very actively interested in, in what can come out of data, both you know, digital platforms as well as visualizations and, and journalism and all sorts of things. So besides opening up uh, the data in different ministries and helping people create, the, helping government create a, a good data portal, we have also started forming communities around this data. So we hosted our Hack VF, which was our first data festival. Um, and in our very first edition, we had about 500 people signed up by day four and 200 people on the waiting list. So it's very interesting to see that there's a huge community waiting to be formed. We also have Code for Mexico City that we do in collaboration with Code for America since almost, we were two months old, I think, when we launched um, this. And this is basically five young programmers working with five different ministries uh, without the city. This is both the programmers as well as the volunteers. So they're also very young people and we very much believe that there's a huge possibility in having the deep-seated knowledge that lies within government be able to link up with these new perspectives and new tools that a younger generation has. Uh, one of the ideas that came out of this was Traxi, which we're launching in a month's time. So basically, uh, we have 100,000 cabs in Mexico City that is that is what cabs used to look like, now they're pink. <laughs> um, we have 100,000 cabs and there's 20,000 pirate cabs in the city of people just like taking their car, painting it up as if it were a taxi, putting it out on the street. And unfortunately, it's these 20,000 cabs where a lot of things happen, such as people being held up and, and, and this and that. So grabbing a taxi off the street became slightly suspect, which we found very sad because in a certain sense, it's a smaller percentage of a larger strata. And this actually makes it very convenient that not two minutes pass before you can hail down a cab in any place of Mexico City. But there is this, this thing of people becoming every time uh, more wary about doing this. So, so what we did was um, 
with, with one of our, our programmers was create this app where you, you, he's pulling in data from four different ministries where you can check that it, it's actually a licensed cab, that he has no uh, police record, that he has uh, all of his uh, uh, environmental uh, green cards and everything that we give out in Mexico City um, in order. And it starts also creating very much in Uber fashion a social rating. You can check it on from Facebook if any of your friends have taken it, and you can also rate the cab. So basically, this starts taking the advantages of, of uh, private enterprise into government as well and being able to create a more competitive social space as well. Um, so this has been quite successful in its first trial runs, and now, as I mentioned, we're putting it out in two months' time. The programmers also on their free time worked on their own projects, such as creating an app where you can listen into satellites that, have, that were passing above a rooftop, and they won the second prize in an international NASA competition, which is very nice. And this is one of the programmers explaining his app to the mayor. Um, we also created a laboratory of data, which is an experimental stop for the data before it goes off to the, to the official platform. I won't get much into it, but just one of the APIs that we created for mobility had for more than four million hits during its fourth, first three months of existence. So there's a lot of hunger out there for these types of uh, conversations and, and new technologies. We also started putting together journalists and programmers and designers and creating multidisciplinary groups that can work around the data. And um, in, in this case, it was very much focused on journalism and five stories came out of this which were then published in, in mass media around Mexico. Uh, for example, how many women are coming into Mexico City to have an abortion from other states because Mexico City is incredibly progressive. We have uh, gay marriage before New York, euthanasia rights, uh, abortion laws in place, et cetera, et cetera. And um, also what the bike usage is during the protests and all sorts of very interesting things that, uh, yeah, that then got published in mass media. We also were fortunate enough to win first prize for the Audi Urban Future Award, basically thinking about how we can start having better data, real-time data, of what happens on the ground in terms of mobility in Mexico City, because 60% of our population actually move, moves across the city in, in informal transport, so it's very difficult to get this data, even though the Ministry of Mobility has opened up everything that it has. And we partnered with uh, Jose Castillo, who's an urbanist and architect, as well as with Carlos Gershenson, who runs a data lab at one of the largest universities in Latin America, in UNAM. And uh, so it's the first time that la this prize goes to Latin America as well as the first time that government is part of the winning team. So I found that strangely exciting. And we are, we're, this program also includes a data donating uh, project platform where as individuals we can donate data, but we're also gathering data from about 30 different um, private companies and telephone companies and such. So we can start amassing data that belongs to the city. So what are some of the things that, that are at the, at the core of the things that we've been experimenting in? I believe that fortunately we have gone past those modernist days where cities were meant to be only practical and efficient and we have started thinking that maybe cities should not only house the human body but also the human imagination. Um, so what we're also trying to do besides having this practical space and having uh, artists and designers be able to work in a place where it's not only their, their artwork that is getting plopped in, in public space or where they're working within the museums, is how can we let them loose across the city? How can this actually inform the way that we think about serious things such as health and environment in this? This is a, a Nomad Plants, an amazing project by Gilberto Esparza that we've been working closely with. And so basically what this is, is a symbiotic creature where it's the plant and the, and the machine are completely intertwined and can live off of each other for about a month. It is completely autonomous. And uh, since it takes for granted that urban rivers are polluted, what it does is it, it has hydrophiliac legs, which means that it can actually sense the humidity of, of uh, the ground. So it walks towards the rivers and then puts the little, the little pipe-like mouth into the river and then purifies the water, feeds the plant, and the plant in turn feeds the robot. And it can actually run away from anybody that tries to, to catch it. So in many ways, it's, it's an exciting thing because these are new types of urban creatures that could inhabit our space. But it's also very exciting because of the civic involvement that it entails. It's very different to go up to a, a town that's near a river 
because there's, there are towns inside of Mexico City, and try to tell people, hey, you know, you shouldn't pollute rivers. And it's very different to have one of these creatures coming up into the town's life and then having people gather around it. And then this becomes the excuse to talk about all of these these subjects, and we're incredibly interested in, in seeing what this means. Um, also, somebody that, w that we are working with that is on my team and is the artificial in intelligence expert also runs a lab for uh, crises, robots. As you probably know, Mexico City is also a place for earthquakes, and we had a huge one in 85, so crisis, pre like, just like crisis management is very important. And they're building a new generation of robots that could actually help during these times. So we're, we're also partnering with them and starting to think about, like, again, like, what are the new ideas that could be out there that not only are useful and practical, but also, in a certain sense, start creating a, a, a type of urban imaginary. And another of the things that we're very interested in is articulating political will and public intention. And this is a huge thing in Mexico City because when you can tap into the social imaginary, it really is very potent. I, I like putting Michael Jackson as a, as a very strange example. Um, once, uh, I think the, the world record for dancing thriller worldwide was about 400 people in a, in a US university. In Mexico City, when there was that same call, we had 13,000 people show up to dance thriller uh, to Michael Jackson. When we had Spencer Turnick in Mexico City, he also broke his record of naked bodies in a public space, even though Mexico City is quite conservative. In, I mean, sorry, Mexico in general is quite conservative, and Mexico City is that bastion of, uh, of creative thought and progressive agendas. So basically, this, I think, is what happens when Mexico City decides to join in a, in a single cause. We also see it with protests. Well, the protests are actually l legally admitted in our constitution as one of our, our rights to freely express ourselves in the city. And there's definitely a younger generation that has taken upon itself to actually manifest what it needs and what it desires and, and really become a lot more politically aware. As you might have heard, we had the same party for more than 72 years. It was called the perfect dictatorship. So this is, our, our the democratic muscle is actually quite new. It has only happened in the last 12 years. And social media is elsewhere, has actually been a very potent way of, of having a younger generation become much more involved in politics. As an interesting number, only 38% of Mexico is actually connected to the internet, and yet we are the fifth country that is more, more, most actively uh, most active on social media in the world. So we, we believe that this, these new ways of communicating, of joining together, will have a huge repercussion in the way that democracy and politics and, and thinking of our, our place as citizens um, it will become very important. And another interesting thing has been that people are not only talking about complaining and what the government should do. But every time we're in protest, as you can see there, we're talking about ideas and about the place of civil society in the transformation of the way that things are being done. So we're very interested in, in starting to think about citizenship as a creative act, not, not, no longer this passive thing of just voting or just complaining, but how can you actually sink your hands into the city and become an active participant and co-creator of the way that, that public policies and cities are evolving. And if we are changing the ways that we think about cities and that we think about society, we should probably also start think, rethinking the way that government functions in these societies. As I mentioned, if, if cities are not only nowadays meant to be practical and efficient, uh, can government actually start thinking about itself beyond the provider of services and thinking of itself as a catalyzer and as a creative agent as well? So these are our things that we've been thinking about in Mexico City, and uh, I look forward to, to the conversation later on in the panel and learning as well of what is happening in Manchester. So thank you very much.